It's my pleasure to introduce the three panelists for this evening. Um, and in no particular order, and they will appear, I think, magically um, as I say who they are. Um, we're going to be joined tonight by um, Tish Warren, who is a priest in the Anglican Church um, of North America and a former campus minister with InterVarsity. So she's got some real experience with uh, the student population, which is wonderful. But she's uh, also a very active writer. Uh, recently, uh, the author of a book, um, Liturgy of the Ordinary, Thinking About Sacred Practice in Our Everyday Lives. So again, very relevant to tonight. Um, she's currently a writer in residence at the Church of the Ascension in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I assume that's where you're calling in from uh, tonight, but you can tell us if that's not right. Uh, and she also writes for several periodicals, regularly Christianity Today, the Religious News Service, um, the New York Times, and she's been really active in thinking about women in ministry um, in particular. So welcome, Tish. Um, our second panelist uh, is uh, Professor Ethan Zuckerman, um, who is a media scholar, blogger, and internet activist, um, and recently a colleague of mine, but he's going to say more about that this evening. Um, so what I think I'll tell you is that uh, he spent time as a Fulbright scholar in Ghana, um, and he is credited with being the father of the pop-up bad. I'm not sure that's a bonus, but possibly it is. It's certainly culturally important. Uh, <laughs> uh, so welcome, Ethan. We're glad you could join us. And then our uh, third panelist is uh, Professor Colin Bowie, uh, who is uh, holds the Edgerton Chair, um, a career development chair. He's an associate professor of mechanical engineering at MIT uh, and um, the recipient of many awards. Uh, most recently, or maybe at least the most recent one I found was in 2016, the Presidential Early Career Award for Science and Engineering. But the thing I'm most excited about, Cullen, uh, is that discovery about rainfall releasing aerosols and explaining finally why we all love that smell of the earth after a light rain. Uh, I remember reading about that in the New York Times and thinking, oh, I've wondered about this my entire life. So welcome, Cullen. So we're gonna begin this evening with um, our three panelists telling us just briefly where they're hanging out in the world at the moment, what a day looks like for them. Um, so um, Cullen, why don't you start since? Absolutely, yeah, thanks for that introduction. And um, for me right now, um, I'm, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but I'm kind of straddling multiple careers, actually two careers normally and under COVID three careers. So the two normal careers are my, my role as a professor at MIT, but then I also have a company I started, which is developing techniques to deliver genetic material to cells for um, gene edited cell therapies, where they'll take cells from your body, edit those cells in order to fight your diseases. So it's like the epitome of personalized medicine. And so I've been for the last two years on leave from MIT actually uh, working on that. Uh, but COVID has brought a third vocation, which is preschool teacher. So I'm uh, <laughs> um, splitting time with my wife and, uh, um, educating and, and what, looking after our three kids who are nine, six, and four. Um, so a day for me, typical day is absolute utter chaos <laughs> of uh, juggling and, um, you know, Zoom calls. And like, I'm always sitting here waiting, like waiting for someone to bust through the door. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's actually quite exciting. I, lo I love being a professor. I love being in a startup. I get to flex different types of muscles in those two different roles. And, um, for me, it's a lot of uh, mentoring and advising, but then also strategy and interacting with potential customers for our company. Great. Thank you, Colin. Um, Ethan, how about you? A typical day and where you're calling in from? Sure, well, I'm at home in Western Massachusetts. I live out uh, a little bit north of Pittsfield, Mass, about 150 miles west of Boston. Um, <clears throat> like Colin, I'm um, balancing teaching grad students and teaching my 10 year old. Um, he has been doing virtual school for the last three months and we have been doing everything from model rocketry to a lot of work in the carpentry shop 
Right. We've been building a miniature golf course. Um, so I have to say, um, time with the 10 year old is uh, at least as much fun as time with my grad students these days. So uh, balancing a little bit between the two, when he's playing Minecraft, I'm on the phone with PhD students. When he's not, uh, sometimes we go fishing. It's a good life. Wonderful. And Tish, you know the drill. Yeah, well, I'm um, in my house on my top floor in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And it's hard for me to say a typical day right now because days, because like everybody else on the planet right now, there's like nothing is typical about 2020. Um, and also in my life, I had, I had a baby eight months ago. Um, so uh, this year has looked different because I took a quite long maternity leave. Um, but a typical day, uh, I'm, I'm a writer, so I spend a portion of every morning writing um, and then returning emails related to writing and um, speaking and that sort of thing. I um, am a writer in residence at, at um, a church in town. And so sometimes I'm doing something with the church or preaching. That's been a lot less since I had our son. Um, but that's part of my life here and hanging out with, um, especially emerging adults, 20s and people in their 20s and 30s. Um, and also doing, I mean, lately there's been a lot of community events and justice work and that sort of thing related to that. Um, and then hopefully, hopefully also, we can talk about some of that justice work later on. So yeah. yeah. And also I have three kids. So um, I also ended up like all of you becoming a homeschool mom. Um, so I have a 10 year old and a seven year old and an eight month old. Great, great. So uh, our, our sort of first substantive question is gonna actually be a little bit different for each one of you and, so, and all of you have already um, sort of hinted in, the, in this direction. So Colin, why don't we start with you um, ag ag again, just to, to follow that. Um, you started to mention that you've got both a startup and your MIT job. So you're in between two kind of different vocations. And we'll, we'll skip the homeschooling for the moment um, in the hopes that that, that doesn't go on forever. Uh, but, uh, you know, how, how did you get into the dual spot and what influenced your decisions? Uh, for me, it's, 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 it's a lot about opportunity. I tend to, I like giving an analogy sometimes to students who ask about this. Um, being that they're, they're kind of two types of people, mountain people who set a goal and the goal is getting to the top of that mountain and everything in life becomes, mm -hmm. you know, angled towards that goal. And then there are river people, like when you're on a river, it's going somewhere, but you don't always know where while you're sitting on it. That's kind of been more my life, uh, going with the flow a bit, like it's directed, but it's not as deterministic, you might say, as the mountain. So for me, um, I became a professor, started in 2010. 2013, I ran across a problem um, that I heard about um, at a conference of delivering genetic material to cells that I had never heard of before, but became fascinated by it and started, um, started working on it. There was no intention of starting a company. There was no intention of being an entrepreneur. The intention was, how can I help? How can I solve this problem? Mm -hmm. Fast forward about four years after that. And what was clear was um, the only way to really solve the problem was an industry. Uh, my my uh, postdoc at the time would present at conferences and people would come up to it afterwards and say, well, where can you buy this? Uh -huh. And my first thought was, well, not from MIT because we don't sell anything. Yeah. So maybe we should start a company to actually allow people to, uh, to be able to use this. So okay. I started a company because that was the way to finish answering the, pro you know, the question right. that we started asking. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so a great example of the meander. Um, Ethan, you recently resigned from your position at MIT um, publicly, very publicly. Um, and we're wondering if maybe you'd say a little something about what does a dream job look like, especially when one didn't look like it was working? Well, let me start by saying that the job that I had at MIT really was a dream job. Um, I was directing a center called the Center for Civic Media. I did that for nine years. Um, I came to MIT with a very unconventional background. I, I don't have any advanced degrees. 
Um, MIT made it possible for me to become a professor in practice. Mm -hmm. And I've had the pleasure of uh, advising some brilliant PhD students who are actually now faculty at some top universities. So no arguments about the job at all. The problem with the job was that I was working for and very closely with Joey Ito, who was the director of the Media Lab, a friend of mine for 15 years um, before we came to the Media Lab. And as I think everyone knows, um, he ended up revealing that he had taken a large amount of money from Jeffrey Epstein. Mm -hmm. um, I found out about this not only from Joey, but from a whistleblower who ultimately um, shared her story with the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And based on what I heard, both from Joey and from this whistleblower, um, I decided I couldn't be associated with him anymore. And in part, because I'd worked so closely with him, I had helped him on a large number of social justice projects. Um, I felt like the only way that I could have control over the situation, because I knew Joey was hoping to keep his job, was for me to say that I wasn't going to work with him anymore. Uh, and that meant leaving the media lab. Um, two really tough choices came after that. The first was that my students came to me and said, look, what about us? And I said, you're right. You know, this is putting you in a terrible situation. I've spent this last year helping them find paths so they can continue their work and move forward. And I think after the initial anger, uh, most of them have forgiven me and sort of understood why I needed to do this. But then the second piece of this was after Joey resigned, uh, my fellow faculty came to me and sort of said, well, why are you leaving? Why would anyone leave MIT? Uh, and unfortunately, the answer is that there were a lot of people who knew what Joey was doing. They included my colleagues. They included higher-ups at the university all the way up to President Wright. Uh, and I don't believe the university handled it well. And at a certain point, I had to go with the decision that let me sleep at night, and that was the decision to leave MIT. Starting in January, I'll be teaching at UMass Amherst. Um, one of the funniest things about this is the people who are not comfortable talking about my decision make the same joke. They say it's a shorter commute, and they're right. Um, <laughs> it's an hour instead of three hours. Uh, but I got to tell you, I drove three hours each way for nine years to teach at MIT, and it was worth every minute of that drive. So, um, so Ethan, I'm going to have to cut you off to make sure that we sure. keep moving. But, um, but it, you know, you've raised this issue of of really, you know, what makes work meaningful as well as, you know, the professional accolades. And, and it's definitely an, a, a theme we want to come back to. Um, Tish, maybe you could zero in on how your theological perspective in particular influences both your day-to-day -day life and the career path that you're following. Yeah, um, well, the first I just want to say this uh, mountain versus river people thing is brilliant so I'm gonna quote you on that uh, often. I, I got that from someone else so I, <laughs> okay. I'll find before you quote me I don't I didn't I'm not the inventor so. <laughs> so I am so strongly in the river people camp there that um so in terms of sort of my career path part of me is like I don't I don't even know what my career I mean my career path is winding and um who knows where it's going but um in general i will say about the no the idea of vocation generally and 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 even my own everyday life um i mean i feel like um there's no part of life that's not theological um so when i when i talk about theology theology isn't like this thing where we're talking about god um and then you know, the rest of our life is untouched by theology. Um, and if in Liturgy of the Ordinary, my book, I talk about brushing your teeth as a theological activity in the sense that it calls up what's, what are bodies for? Why is it worth taking care of them? Um, uh, mortality, like if our body's just going to wear out, like <laughs> why, why fight it? Or, or, or or do we worship our bodies? Like, so what, what's the point of physicality in, in the world? Um, so what I'm saying is all of it, if, if toothbrushing is part of it and the, all of our activities um, can become 
art, I don't even think it's can become. It's not something we put on it. All of our activities, I think, are inherently meaningful. And we can't engage the world. We can't get out of bed in the morning without, um, without making assumptions or, or thinking through, whether conscious or not, what we believe about God, what we believe about ourselves, what we believe about humanity, where we are go where we're coming from, where we're going, what the point of any of this is, what love is, what love is not. Um, these are all deeply theological questions, but um, it and they they play out not primarily on having, you know, heady conversations about John Calvin or the Roman Catholic magisterium, they play out over dinner tables. They play out in the way we um, interact with our parents and our friends and our roommates and our um, spouses, or they play out in um, these sort of the nitty gritty of our life. So, um, so part of, I think why work matters is that um, it, from a Christian perspective, I would say it's, um, this is, um, work is given to us by God. We are, we are people that work. Um, even in the creation story, in the beginning of all things, humans were made to work. And I can get more into, I think, um, Jesus's incarnation, becoming man. I'm, I'm going to have worker. to speed you along to right. But in general, what I want to say is all of life is theological. Okay. And so um, work being part of life, a huge part of life, actually, for most of us, we spend a lot of our time working, whether that's um, folding the laundry or at our job. Okay. And that, that also is a theological activity. So you're, you're reminding me of a really powerful book I read as an undergraduate in college, um, Practicing His Presence. And... Uh, you know, have thought about that potato peeling for God for, well, since, you know, since I was that age. But, but maybe, Cullen, um, let's jump back to you for a moment. And maybe you could say a little bit more about that experience of, you know, people want this thing. Nobody's making it or selling it. What's, what's meaningful about all of that for you? Is it, I mean, thinking about, thinking about it as meaning as opposed to just an opportunity. Yeah, so the, the meaning for me is, is always about where can I make the biggest impact? How can I impact the most lives? Mm -hmm. um, what, what am I uniquely called to do? Like, it was, it was really clear, um, you know, my, my um, former postdoc and I, who's the CEO of the company, we were the only people in the world who could do this. Like, we invented this thing. We saw this problem. If we don't do it, this problem doesn't get solved. And also there's a bit of um, like really wanting to see your work have, like, as I mentioned earlier, impact. Like we're trying to cure genetic diseases. Like my son has a genetic disease. He has sickle cell disease. And um, people are working on cures and the, the technology that um, we've invented can help, you know, the order 100,000 people in the US that have this genetic disease many of which are um, African-American and people of color. Um, so so it's, a, it's a group that's largely been disadvantaged from the perspective of healthcare. But not only that, like there are also numerous people working on cancers um, that need technologies like ours in order to really deliver those cancers to patients. And when I think about the ability to potentially um, save lives and reduce the amount of human suffering on the planet. I mean, you think about the number of people that die of cancer. It's, it's hard to find someone that's, who's, whose life hasn't been touched by cancer in one way or, one way or another. Okay. Um, the ability to potentially be involved in that is, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty attractive. I mean, we want our work to matter. Um, Tish was talking about the Garden of Eden. And I mean, work was in the garden before sin was in the garden, right? So heaven's going to have work. And I think one of the things that'll make that work very en enriching is the, is the feeling that it's going to matter. There's nothing worse than working on a problem set or working on something mundane and you're looking at it it's like, I don't think anyone cares about this. But so, you know, Colin, when people care, it's, it's exciting. It's, it's interesting to me because, you know, it's, 
it's maybe easier for us to see meaningfulness when something affects many people. Maybe Ethan, maybe you could say a little bit about those few graduate students, because you know, they weren't hundreds or thousands. They were a handful of graduate students, or maybe your son's mini golf course for one son. How do we, how do we think about meaningfulness sure, in the sure. context of numbers? I, I think sometimes meaning comes from what you are uniquely positioned to do. Mm -hmm. um, there's really no one else who can be the father to my child in the way that I can be his father. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of different ways that I could outsource that work, I'm sure. Uh, maybe there's a gig economy service to teach him how to fit. Um, but I don't think he's going to have that same experience that we're sort of able to have together. I actually think that experience is, is pretty similar um, with grad students in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're working with someone, you know, as, as Colin was just sort of explaining, someone who, who really is working with you intellectually on a very, very hard problem, that's an incredibly uh, personal commitment. It's an incredibly important relationship. And ideally, you're sort of bringing out the best in each other. The other thing that I'm sort of finding is that through that work of nurturing grad students, of helping them sort of become who they are, it is possible to touch thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. One of my doctoral students is Joy Bildam Winnie, um, who has been an incredibly effective activist in getting the facial recognition tech banned because she was able to demonstrate that there's a strong racial bias associated with it. And that systems that see my face just fine don't see her face because they do uh, far more poorly on darker skin and on women's faces. And she has been at the center of a movement that has essentially gotten many governments uh, to put a moratorium on using this tech for law enforcement, knowing that it has distinct racial biases towards it. Maybe the most important thing that I learned in the nine years here is that I can do my own work, I can put my own ideas out there, but sometimes the work that I'm really called on to do is that work holding up and uplifting and supporting my students because it's a very critical moment in their lives. They're transitioning from being learners to being the people who are putting forward those ideas themselves. And being part of that transformation is, I, I have to say, probably the most rewarding work I've ever done. Mm. That's a really beautiful statement, I think, about, um, you know, so, so much of what those of us who teach appreciate about teaching, um, because, or, or parenting for that matter, right, that it feels so one-on-one -on -one, uh, much of the time, but in fact, there are these sort of grandmother and great-grandmother and great-great-grandmother effects, um, and you don't really know where they'll all end up, do you? Um, Tish, if we could turn back to you, you know, at this current moment, many people have lost their jobs. And, you know, how do we, how do we think about that, the prospect of losing a job or the reality of losing a job? And how do, how do you minister um, as, a, as a clergy member to people who, whose meaning in their work maybe has been taken away from them? Yeah. So um, that's a big question. Um, I, think, I think there's um, a few things to say about it and I probably can't cover all of it in the time we have. I mean, once there is a sense where um, work and systems of work and in the world and in the United States specifically um, are broken, that they're, um, they, they, well, from a Christian perspective, they experience consequences of, of the fallenness, the wreckedness of, of things, that there's, there's something sort of cracked in the system um, and not just in the system, but in ourselves in life. Um, and so there is a place for real lament over work. Um, uh, a place of of recognizing things are not as they ought to be, um, and we see this even in scripture. I mean, the book of Ecclesiastes has so much lament about work specifically, uh, that the futility of work, the toil of work, mm -hmm. um, 
like Colin was saying, so the like the meaninglessness of work, um, and 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 to the point where the writer of the book says he hates life. That's a quote because of uh, because of the futility of work, which I love because it sounds like such a. It's like a, I feel like it's someone would tweet that like I hate my life because like work is so awful right now. Um, Ecclesiastes said, so, "I hate my life." Yeah. <laughs> so over the top and like you know. But um, so he was feeling it is the point. And um, so there is a place of, of, of lament, I think. Um, and then there's a place of, of watching um, for how God um, might be working in that. One of the ways I've seen that in my own church beautifully is we have had some folks mm-hmm. lose jobs. And for right now, and this is a reality across America, actually people that are struggling the worst or that are in... Mm-hmm. Um, more blue collar jobs or retail jobs, lower wage earning jobs are the ones more likely to lose their job because of COVID now. And we have seen folks with resources and with more money um, anonymously donate large sums of money to other folks in our church who have lost jobs. So people, it's been beautiful as a clergy person to watch the church Mm -hmm. take care of one another in that. Um, But then lastly, I would say um, we need to work for better work and work for um for folks to be able to find meaningful work again the thing about losing a job is it's it's bad to lose a paycheck but there's more at stake than that i really believe human beings are made to work all of us are um it's part of um what human flourishing looks like and so when we lose that um there is great difficulty and one of the things uh, the, there's a bruderhof is a is a community of folks in western pennsylvania and one of the things that's remarkable about them and i wasn't planning on talking about bruderhof specifically but <laughs> they make sure that everyone in their community has work to do and so they 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 do they make um toys and medical equipment they have all kinds of um cottage industries and a friend of mine went and there were elderly folks that were um packaging things and doing things and they the person said you know you could get a machine to do that much more efficiently and they said um yeah but efficiency isn't the point the point is to give those folks meaningful work and they were sitting around and talking and enjoying each other's they were doing it but it was a way the community found work for mm-hmm. every single person even though it could be done more efficiently another way but the point wasn't just mm-hmm. maximum efficiency the point was to um really allow people to have meaningful work th- for the entirety of their lives and so um and 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 work that they could participate in and enjoy so um the point is i this could get in a le- much larger um, discussion about systems that we can't get into because of time but i will say um for folks who have lost work, that I think that we need to um, figure out ways that they can continue to engage the fullness of who they are, um, and um, and find ways for people to and and that may not be paying work in the short term, um, but yeah. So this gets into yeah, issues of economic realities and also. Um, ways that we need systems to change, but also caring for neighbor. I mean, part of what caring for neighbor looks like doesn't just look like um, making sure everyone has a paycheck, although that's part of it. It's making sure that people have meaningful, have meaning in their lives and have a reason to get up in the morning. Ish, let's hold on to some of that because we're, we're going to circle back to thinking about systemic problems. But before we do that, maybe Ethan, since since you voluntarily put yourself out of work, at least temporarily, um, you've—I mean—you've already identified, you know, some of the issues involved in that decision. But but maybe you could reflect on how, in the, the ways in which that is the same or different from, you know, losing a job involuntarily. Well, in a funny way, I sort of felt like I did lose my job involuntarily. I, I, uh, I figured you were going to say that as soon as the words were out of my mouth. It's interesting. I mean, I, um, I found myself in a situation that I just couldn't live with. And um, had I made a decision other than the decision that I made, 
um, I, I wouldn't be being true to myself. Um, so in many ways, I, I felt uh, like I found myself accidentally out of a job. I think certainly my students and, and my staff, I, I run a fairly large lab, um, felt that way as well, uh, that, that Joey's decision followed by my decision to put them in a situation where they were out of a job. Um, I think what's been interesting is with um, a year's distance, right? Because I, I actually resigned at the end of August. So I guess we're about nine months out. Um, almost everyone in my lab is in a better place. In fact, maybe the most remarkable bit was the person who's really been sort of my right hand, uh, who's been a research scientist at MIT for 15 years now. And there's nothing wrong with being a research scientist. It's a great career. But this is somebody who had grown enormously. He is now starting a tenure track position at Northeastern. Uh, that would not have happened had we not sort of had this tumult. So I think sometimes um, this tumult, this dislocation, is this opportunity to sort of reassess and ask yourself what you want to be doing and, and what you can be doing. And maybe just to echo two things, um, I, I'm firmly with Colin on, on the river versus mountain camp. Um, my life has been confusing and weird and gone in a thousand and one different directions. I'm on my fourth career. I didn't um, teach in an academic institution until I was 37 years old. Uh, so the, the, it took me a while to get here. And those twists and turns can be some of the most rewarding pieces of this. I think at a moment of tumult, whether it's semi-voluntary in my case or involuntary, um, as Tish was saying, sort of asking that question of what can you do and who can you help seems to be incredibly valuable. Um, one of the things that was very important to me was making sure that these debates that we're having about the future of technology, the future of social media, are much bigger and much broader, that it's not just MIT and Stanford. It was really important to me to go to a state school. It was really important for me to work with a, a different group and sort of figure out how could I diversify the groups with people that I could work with. Right. So maybe one thing to do at that moment of tumult is to sort of say, is there a situation where I can move towards helping someone who needs the help. And maybe that's the bend in the river that starts revealing what that path ahead ends up looking like. Thank, thank you, Ethan. Um, Colin, if we can turn back to you, um, we've, we've, we've sort of started to scratch the surface of some of the systemic problems, and you've already identified medical needs of the African-American community in particular, um, but employment, needs are also distributed. I mean, the employment difficulties are distributed unequally. And, and I wonder if, you know, from your perspective, sitting in an elite institution and now a founder of a company, how do, how do you see the issues in particular, um, you know, in the African American community around work and the quality of work? I think that had come up a little bit before as well. Okay, yeah, you poked a bear here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no, so I have 90 seconds on uh, black people and work. Uh, so starting with slavery, no, <laughs> well, well, actually, we, we, we actually kind of do. Um, um, since slavery, so we just celebrated Juneteenth, right? Mm -hmm. Which I use that word celebrated. Mm, I mean, it's kind of a celebration, but it's also like, I mean, I've been, you know, the, the current moment has me diving into history and I've, I've done a lot of diving in history, but the more I looked, it's just, the history is just ugly. You came out of slavery and it's like, okay, you're free, but you can't own land and we're not gonna employ you. Um, and when we do employ you, we're not gonna pay you much and you don't have the right to vote. Um, and actually you still can be enslaved. Um, the, even the constitution still says this, if you're, uh, um, if you're convicted of a crime. Right. And so we're gonna start actually start convicting you of crimes too. Mm -hmm. And um, um, we're gonna continue to lynch your young men um, if they show any promise, but you're free. Um, like that's effectively been the U.S. for African Americans for the last, um, you know, basically since we've been here, it's been this moving target. Um, like you think you get there and then the target keeps moving. Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting is in our society, we tend to value people by their work. 
Mm -hmm. um, even when you meet someone, um, I've tried to get out of this, but it's hard. You ask like, what do you do? Right. And what do you do is always like, you know, where do you work? I'm one time I, someone asked me what I want, what I do. I need to say like, I'm a dad, you know, I'm a, I'm a husband. And like, if you want to ask me about my work, ask me about my work, but what I do, I am not my work. And so this goes to, um, some things that, that have been touched on here, which is just that we tend to define our value by our work. Our work becomes more than just work. It's our, it's everything. It's not just a good thing. It's everything. It, and so in that society, then when you have a large group population that is without work, that group becomes worth nothing yeah. if you value people by their work. Um, and I think this is why, um, you know, bringing things to the current, which is why people are saying Black Lives Matter, it's because Black Lives Matter has nothing to do with work. Like some people will, you, you, you see this every time um, a young black man or young black woman gets killed. It's like, well, what did they do? Well, well were, they, were they resisting arrest? And well, look at his record. That has nothing to do with the value of that human being. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing to do. If a cop came and Lord forbid shot me, it should, there shouldn't be a bigger uproar because I might be viewed as a productive member of society. That has nothing to do with my value. And it's totally dehumanizing when the conversation goes there. Um, so I'm sorry, this is a ramble, but I mean, this well, is intersecting race and value and work. And there's been a pretty insidious, I would say systemic, um, systemic um, effort to, to suppress black people and to suppress their ability to work um, and to really um, I effectively kind of tarnish their perceived value um, to the world. So Colin, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I poked the bear, but I, I want to ask you one sort of really directed question because we don't have much time and I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to sort of, you know, weigh in on these really critical issues. What's one thing you think MIT can be doing? MIT needs to educate everyone on these issues. Um, graduate students, undergrads, faculty, staff, you, everyone needs to know that basically the, this country was founded with racism embedded. MIT was founded with racism embedded. Every, any organization founded before the 60s absolutely has racism embedded. And after the 60s, it might have it. So you should just assume that it's there mm -hmm. and you need to educate everyone on it. You can't okay. continue to do programs for diversity and assume everyone's on board and they, and they understand the history because the fact is that most people don't. Okay, so one thing MIT can be doing better is better education. Tish, what's one thing the church can be doing? Well, um, the one Sunday, thing with Tish. Sunday morning is still <laughs> the most segregated um, hour of American life. And so, um, Man, I, it's, I can't really say one thing um, because there's like a thousand. <laughs> things, but I will, I'll say um, this, if Jesus was a reconciler, um, then we have to start caring about multi-ethnic spaces. And that doesn't j look like white people running a church that black people go to. We need black, le we need leadership of people of color. Okay. Um, and there, that gets into a whole lot of stuff about um, the way we fund education and uh, all other kinds of things, but that we need, we need to raise up um, leaders, uh, people of color and, and white folks, I mean, it, I would encourage folks to um, go to a church with black leadership um, when they can. And um, obviously people in the pews have a different responsibility here than the leaders. Um, but I, in general, let me just say that um, race in America and racism system, systemic white supremacy has affected essentially all work, all, all industries. So whatever sphere Mm -hmm. um, people find themselves in, including like being a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways to um, kind of push back and, and, and try to be anti-racist in, in our employment and sphere of influence. Okay, I'm going to still that down to we've got to start going to church together in a meaningful way. I'm just, just, 
I'm just yeah. gonna and obviously that's not gonna happen next Sunday like but we need to at least start talking. We need to get churches together. We need to have conversations. We need to have black churches and yeah. predominantly black churches and predominantly white churches that um, that form deep, honest, caring relationships with one another. And, and I, I have to I have to jump on I have to jump okay. in on on that because I love I love all that, but I don't think it's I don't I wouldn't want people to come away and say oh the the cure is people going to interracial churches because I actually think the cure is Jesus and the reason we don't have these multiracial churches honestly if you ask me is because we haven't really taken in what Jesus said Jesus who was more different than any human being on this planet came and found a way to be in community with us and if we really take that model as our you know as our how we how we're going to live these the racial differences we have are small compared to the difference that Jesus overcame and how did he overcome that, come that difference? He suffered with us. Like, I know Jesus loves me when I look at his hands and I look at his feet and I look at his wounds. And until, until people of both races, any, all races in the U.S., not both, but until people of all races see that we're willing to suffer for one another, everyone you know that you, you say loves you has suffered with you. There's not a person you will say, this person loves me, if they haven't suffered with you. And until we are willing to suffer with one another across racial lines, we're not going to have reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And so I think a big issue, if you just talk about black and white in the U.S., black people feel like we've seen a lot. We've done a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. And anyone who is looking to reconcile and is white and isn't willing to suffer isn't willing to really cross that bridge. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that's the gospel. That's just the gospel. That's just Jesus. That's not magic. That's just actually, that's Jesus's message. I came and I suffered for you so that you can suffer for one another and be in community. So Colin, and that's a better answer than mine. That's why I say what he says. That's a better answer. Okay. <laughs> I want to give, I want to give Ethan the chance too, though, before we run out of time, but thank you, Colin, for jumping back in because that I mean, it, the, the net result might be that we go to church together and we go to school together, but it has to start from somewhere else. Yeah. That's the fruit. That's the fruit. Yeah. But I and I'm sorry. I know I need to say one more thing. But part, of, part of that is uh, <laughs> I think um, all of us, because again, like we're not going to, I'm not saying start a new church on Sunday, but I think all of us can allow Jesus to trouble um, all the assumptions of our culture. And so it's so easy to say like, you're like right or left you're like this you think this way or you think that and i just think um if i do think jesus explodes it explodes all the categories and makes things way messier um but i do think we can just let um the story of christianity trouble um the story of america and okay. american politics Ethan, you've now had lots of time to figure out what you want to say. One of the things that I've been uh, amazed and, and, and blessed with this time at MIT is this opportunity, um, not necessarily to get on the pedestal myself, but to try to let other people um, have that visibility. And Early in my time, I realized that, that this was one of the great things that I could do was try to get out of the way and, and let my students shine. What I discovered a couple years in was that what was really transforming my work was um, letting students, and, and by having a really diverse team of students, tell me what was important to them. So my work tends to be on questions like, what do people talk about on the internet? Why do we talk so much about Trump? Why don't we talk about other things? Uh, and I write papers on things like that. Probably the most influential research that's come out of my lab over the last couple of years is on race and facial recognition. Um, a great paper this year about uh, what virtual reality might mean for African imagination um, based on a lot of field work in Kenya. One of the things that my lab is best known for uh, is a project called Make the Breast Pump Not Suck, which was a hackathon led by nursing mothers to try to figure out how the breast pump could be better. And so part of what I, I really think is, is central to these teaching professions mm -hmm. is sort of realizing that you can give your space, you can give your attention 
But what's most powerful is if you can listen to the people you are working with, the people who are in theory learning from you, and give them the opportunity to bring to the table the issues that are most important to them and help them in the process lead. For me, that's really been the transformation that I've been experiencing over these years is learning that leading, for me at least, is not saying, hey, let's all go over there. It's to actually learn from this magnificent group of people that I'm surrounded with and then try to help them get where they're going and, and, and lead by following. And um, I, I think there's lessons for that um, however we choose to understand our role. But, but realizing the opportunities you have to lift people up and the opportunities you have to, to be a leader while following, I think can be incredibly powerful. So, so I have found this just really inspirational. Um, and there's so much more I know all three of you want to say and that I would love to say too, but I think it's time uh, to open up for the questions that I presume have been piling up in Slido. Um, so I'm going to call on the student moderator to let us know what the chat is looking like. Hey, hi everyone. Um, my name is Diana and I'm a rising junior at MIT majoring in electrical engineering and computer science. On campus, I'm a member of MIT's Asian Christian Fellowship and I'm really excited to moderate the Q&A with Elena today. So the first question we have is, what practical advice would you give to someone unsure what it is that they're uniquely called to do and find themselves unhappily bouncing around various jobs? Um, well, since you all identified yourselves as river people, um, it probably doesn't matter who wants to take this one. Maybe Cullen, do you wanna? Yeah, I had, I had some quick thoughts. I mean, I think part of it is taking the pressure off, even that term called to do. Mm -hmm. I feel like you have multiple callings. Like I'm called to be a dad. I'm called to be a son, called to be a brother. I have two brothers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm called, you know, in my work. But that, my, my work is just one of the callings. So I think putting work in its proper place we, for whatever reason, we tend to use calling and think only vocation as if that's the only place where God can lead us. And that's, in my opinion, that's, that's, not, that's not true. So I think first, take the pressure down that your whole life narrative is not going to be based on where you're spending your nine to five. That's the first part. And then in thinking about what you're going to do, I, I tend to advise my students to, to think about three things. Where are you gifted? Um, so for me, I love basketball, but I'm not tall enough. Um, so that wasn't in the cards. Where are you gifted? Where are you getting opportunities? And what does the world need? I find that people that overlap those three Venn diagrams, their gifts, their talents, or their gifts, opportunities, and what the world needs. And if you're working right in the center, um, that's, I think, um, that's where you're called for now. Um, it doesn't have to be your whole life. That's the other thing. This doesn't have to, this, the next thing you do doesn't have to be your, your life's work. Um, I think sometimes there's too much information out there. And mm -hmm. I find that young people are reading about people who become billionaires at 30 years old and they think they're behind if they haven't founded a company by 23. And mm -hmm. that's just it's not normal or true. Yeah. And that narrative is not, it's, that's not your path. So walk your path, do the best thing next. Don't worry. Don't always, it's fine to have plans, but make your plans in pencil. Um, it's fine to just do the next best thing in front of you. Okay. Uh, I love thinking of threes. I want to add a three to that real quick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, I've always done what I've been fascinated by. And I've tried to follow what was most interesting to me. Um, and the money's followed. Uh, and I realize that's an easy thing to say when you're secure and you're a professor and you're comfortable uh, but that worked for me when I was, you know, 19 years old and broke and I'm trying to make my living doing carpentry. Uh, if you're doing what fascinates you, there's a very good chance that, that good things will come out of it. The second is uh, do what lets you sleep at night. Um, and, and that's a rule that helps you decide when it's time to step away from something. And then when you're deciding where to step to, um, choose people. Um, you can learn a lot of different things in any job. 
Um, but jobs are also an opportunity to, to interact with some fantastic people. And if you find yourself looking at something and saying, these are people I admire, these are people who I want to be with, these are people that I want to learn from, that's an incredible upside. And so if you're sort of doing those river bends and trying to decide a branch to do, those can be really good ways to sort of choose between one branch and another. So I'm going to um, steal the privilege of the chair and uh, just jump in on the choose people since this is an audience that has lots of students in it. This is the single best advice we can give you for what classes to take. Choose people. Don't worry nearly so much about what the quote topic of the course is. Find out who you want to learn from. Okay, that's my, my one little bit of editorializing. Um, Tish, can we skip you on this one and get the next question? Um, I mean, you can. I want to say, I, I feel like, but can I, can I say one thing? Yeah, definitely. I, I am like the queen. I had so many jobs in my early twenties that I just hated. And, um, and it felt, I mean, it's easy. I, it, it's not easy, but the, when we're talking about meaningful work, we can get real big. And when you're, when you're doing clear work that like impacts justice or that heals people with cancer or that like is, I mean, preaching the gospel or whatever, <laughs> like, yeah. There can be this clear meaning, um, but I had so many jobs that were just, um, just felt so um, meaningless. And I was doing for the paycheck and I wasn't helping anyone and I didn't know. And I think honestly though, I've, I learned so much and was formed by that. So my one advice would be pay attention to what you hate and why you hate it. I think sometimes learning what you don't want to do or what you're not interested in is as helpful as what you are. Um, and um, like, let the car be an idol. You don't have you don't have to be going up the mountain at all times. I think um, I think learn this experience that I had that was frustrating at the time has been really beneficial. Um, and and even make space to explore things that as hobbies that you're not getting paid for, that you're interested in, find, and, and pay attention to where you find energy in your life, which may not be in your, the job you're getting a paycheck for, right? It may be in another community or people or um, something else entirely, gardening. So, so Tish, thank you, because that is actually a really good point. Um, my husband and I have long said that the single best thing our older son ever did was the summer he was the closing night supervisor, shift supervisor at a Dunkin' Donuts. Because boy, did he learn about the kinds of jobs lots of people have in the world and really developed his empathy skills. So oh, yeah. I could tell, I won't take up time, but I could tell you stories of of course. all kinds of jobs yeah. like that. that um. So Diana, why don't you give us the next question? I can actually jump in and give the next question. Oh, oh okay. That's all right. Sorry. Um, but the next one that we have is, how have you all grappled with the importance of caring for your family while pursuing work that has the potential to impact thousands to millions of people? Um. <laughs> yes. so. Do you want to take that one first? I, I, don't, oh, oh, I th this is, um, I, I need to say, th to start this by saying I am a feminist. So, um, because what I'm about to say is not going to sound like that. So you just need to believe me that I promise I am. Um, but I feel like this question, I feel like women talk about this question differently than men talk about this question. Yeah. Um, and there's all kinds of reasons for that. Um, but it is um, more complex for women to think through this. And I could do a whole other Veritas forum on just this subject um, because I have wrestled with it. But I will say that um, my husband and I have um, walked through this together and this has looked like different ways at different times in our life. Um, and we've figured it out and there's been times uh, I've worked more, he's worked less, he's worked more, I've worked less, and different seasons have looked like different things. We have been blessed to have the flexibility to do that, and we know that a lot of people don't or aren't. Um, but even in that, I think it's a struggle um, that some of this is personality, but I don't think it's all that he can be at work and, and not, he doesn't think about our kids when he's at work. 
Um, and when I'm at work, I think about my kids constantly. And when I'm with my kids, I think about work constantly. And that's um, every woman that I know has, when they're in our most vulnerable, honest moments has, has raised this as a struggle. Um, so I want to say it's very possible to care for your family um, and do work, other kinds of work. Um, and, um, but it is always a struggle. And I, and, and this is partly why we have to rediscover the meaning of all work, um, all work from someone being a janitor to someone being the president to someone staying at home and changing a dirty diaper, um, to, you know, finding a cure for, you know, malaria. So I think, um, I think, um, it's the, the point of work isn't how many people can we impact only. That is a good question, but there's also, um, I think the calling of love. And I think that matters. Um, and investing in, in children is a hard and beautiful work in and of itself. So Tish, um, I agree with you that men and women do very often think about these things differently. And that's precisely why I didn't send this question your way first, because <laughs> I think, you know, the instinct is for people to think, well, if the question is how to combine family and work, then we should be consulting women. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot it back into Ethan's court if I can. Sure. Let me start by saying that um, this is not a balance that I've always handled as well as I would like to. Uh, I'm divorced. I get divorced during my time at MIT. Uh, my guess is the fact that I work three hours away from where I live had something to do uh, with the breakup of my marriage. Um, my uh, dear ex is a congregational rabbi. Um, so particularly over the last few months as she's tried to figure out how to bring uh, her rabbinic work online. Uh, and I had the luxury of being able to say to my students and my colleagues, look, I'm gonna be spending um, multiple days a week trying to homeschool and really shoulder that part of the load. Um, I think I've been able to be more equitable, but you know, being more equitable for four months is probably not the same thing as being more equitable for 10 years. I think uh, it's an incredible balancing act throughout a family um, to figure out how you take care of each other, particularly how you take care of kids and how you take on work where you really hope to be touching and changing the world. What's worked incredibly well for us is in some ways having a bigger family. We now have a family that is me, my partner, my ex, her best friend, our kid, and somehow sort of collectively we're able to all be more present uh, rather than feeling like we're forcing each other out of this. But it, it certainly hasn't been an easy path and I have uh, enormous respect for anyone who's on top of this because I never feel like I'm on top of this. I have to, I know, I know we wanted, we don't want everyone I to know, answer. Colin, but, I couldn't but leave you out. Father's Day was two days ago. I mean, come on. Um, so I, I think um, for, for, for me, um, once again, you know, I think like Tish, we share, share a similar, you know, faith background and, you know, belief in Christ. And um, if my kids, if I'm supposed to love the world and I'm supposed to love my neighbor, if my kids and my wife don't know that I love them, I'm not living a consistent life, mm -hmm. right? That's not a life of character. If I'm, if I'm here on this Veritas forum saying that, you know, Jesus is the way and he loves you and we're supposed to love our neighbors, but my literal housemates, the people that live with me, don't know that I love them, mm -hmm. then I have failed as a dad and as a husband. That doesn't mean everything's perfect. That's not what I'm saying. That doesn't mean that it's equitable. I don't even know what equity means, to be honest. Um, it's a moving target. What does equity mean? Um, um, but at the same time, like my wife and my kids need to know that they are a higher priority than my work. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean in terms of time all the time but they need to know that. And my kids, your kids, your kids know it because you can't fake it. They know where they stand. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember when this started happening, um, my wife and I decided we were just gonna split the day up. 
So we both have jobs. It wasn't a split for about money or who it was like, okay, I take the morning and you take the afternoon. We've done that for the last three, four months. Fact is I'm, I'm publishing less papers right now. Mm -hmm. I'm getting less work done. Like it's a fact. I can't be that type of dad that I just said and get all the work done. So my career, I'm sure it's taking a hit, but in the end, um, that's, you know, I, I want to live a consistent life and I want on my, on my tombstone, right? I, I sometimes joke this with my students, with my students, like on my grave, no one ever says like, yeah. bring me my science paper. I want to hold it one more time. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, it's it's going to be, it's going to be people that you're going to want. And I want my kids to be there with their dad. And so. Helen, um, if it's any yeah. consolation, my kids are grown up and out of the house. And I'm also getting less academic work done because I'm on so many committees trying to figure out what MIT should do. So, you know, I feel like the committees have become my kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, committee work in academia is babysitting, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's got the next question for us? We've got to a... take that one. So Jake asks, um, when does it make sense to pursue an interest as just a hobby instead of a career and vice versa? Hmm. Who would like to jump in on that first? Actually, can I say a little something just real quick? So one of the things that I figured out when I started working at MIT and was trying to raise kids, and I realized I had no time for any of the things that I like to do. And so very quickly I decided, well, I just have to figure out what are the things I wanna do, baking, making paper, textile work, and I have to figure out how to bring them into the classroom and pretend that they're part of my MIT job. And I've been doing that ever since. So I'll, I'll start by saying that. Somehow convince your employer that your hobbies are essential to your work. <laughs> I mean, I never planned on being a writer at all. I am, wanted to be a priest or I didn't, I wasn't even Anglican. I wanted to be a pastor or something. And uh, I thought I was going to be overseas and working with folks in I spent most of my 20s working with folks in poverty. I thought that's what I was doing. And I took a poetry class because I loved it. And I um, started writing for a friend because she was bugging me about it. And um, it, it, just sort of, it just sort of grew and became a thing. So, and so to some extent, I'm not a great person to answer this because I want to say like sometimes your hobby becomes your job and then it's funny you kind of miss it as a hobby it changes it it's like oh I gotta do this now like for my job I gotta find another hobby I gotta bake bread or something and then <laughs> maybe I'll become a baker but um but I do think um I think hobbies are a really really important thing because I think it's easy um especially maybe when you're younger to think that your job has to incorporate all your passions, all your vocations, but it just can't. It, it, that's, and so, um, so I think if there's parts of you that need to be expressed, if you're a creative and need to be, or making music or you love science, but that's not what you're going to mainly do as a job. Um, I think it's still, I think our vocation, and Colin said this earlier, but I think we need to make, we have several vocations, not just one, and it's not always what you do for a job. Mm -hmm. So I think the things that you stir your heart, um, that are part of your own flourishing, you got, you, you we have to learn to make space for, um, even if we're not getting paid for them. Colin, are you still playing basketball? I am not. I do have a um, college football podcast that I do, which makes absolutely no money, but brings a smile on my face and our three listeners, um, including <laughs> uh, me, my co-host, and occasionally my wife. Um, I will reference uh, something Tish mentioned, Ecclesiastes, because this verse popped into mind. Ecclesiastes 11.6, in the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. So why not try, as long as you can, just hustle and do both. Don't, don't withhold that hobby from your heart. Um, you might get good at it and maybe your day job and your night job become, become a thing, so. Ethan, you wanna throw something in there? 
No, let's let's keep going with questions. Okay. Let's get the next question then. Something else. All right. So our next question is: It feels so easy as an MIT student for work to turn into an idol. How do we ensure our toil as grad students, but also as undergrads, is advancing God's kingdom and not our own pride? That is a great question. It's very relatable. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, I think that's that. That's back back to like the back back to the basics. If you if you're coming at it, coming at it from a, the Christian perspective, the Bible talks about crucifying yourself, which is basically literally every morning you have to wake up and say, um, "It's not about me." Mm -hmm. Everything in our culture is telling you it's about you, and it's your it's your life, it's your job, it's your money, it's your relationship, it's your happiness. Um, everything is telling you it's all about you. And the Bible says it's actually not about you at all. It's about your neighbor and it's about God. And you have to tell yourself that every single morning. And it, it actually, looking at how people do their work, it's actually hard to tell. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, and I don't think it's necessarily the type of work you do. Um, there are very few types of work that you could do and say, well, that's not Christian work. Like Christians can make any, most, most types of work. Um, but it's more so like the how you do it and the, um, where is your heart. And you have to do the hard work every single day because our hearts want to grasp on to something else. They want to grasp on to something tangible. I give a quick analogy and then I'll let this go. Um, many, many people can relate to this. You grow, Growing up, you're an MIT student. You probably got good grades. You get good grades and like your mom or dad would give you a pat on the back or give you a hug or a kiss and say, I love you. They're not saying, I love you because you got good grades but they kind of are like, they're not, but they are. And so you start becoming attached to, you start attaching your value and your ability to be loved to your performance. And then you get to MIT and you get hit over the head with 801 um, or whatever. And it's like, now it's not just, I got a bad grade on this test. It's, am I a bad person? Like, how did you get there? It was a slow, steady creep. Mm -hmm. No one ever probably explicitly told you, um, you are only your grades. But somehow, after years and years of achievement, and you start building this castle of yourself and your self-worth based on performance, all of a sudden you got there. You have to basically tear down that castle every single day, um, or else your heart will build it up on the things you're doing. Colin, I, I feel like you've really answered that so well. Can we sneak in one more question? Is that okay with Tish and Ethan? Okay. All right, so the next one we have is, in order to be successful, it seems that you have to work long hours or essentially become your work. How can I be successful without giving up life and balance? Ethan or Tish, I'm gonna give that over to you. Sure. So I, part of it I think has to do with how do you define success. Right. Um, I do think there are people who are building companies and making a great deal of money, but also have no inner life, no friends, no personal life. Um, and for me, that's not success. Um, I think the question is, it's a multivariable equation. Um, for me, success looks like some combination of what am I doing for the people that I most care about? What am I doing for the people that I've made commitments to? What am I doing for the ideas and the principles and the projects that I'm working on? And how do I solve that system of equations, not just how do I solve one of them? I think um, it's too easy in some ways to hold on to things that are sort of easy ways of keeping score. Um, did I found my company? Did it make money? Uh, you know, did I get into Y Combinator? And, and I guess one of the things that I would just sort of suggest is be really suspicious of anyone who can put a single number on her or his success because they're avoiding the hard part. And the hard part is solving the system of equations, not solving a single equation. Did you want to add anything to that? I mean, I bet you work a really long day with those three kids and the writing and the pastoring. Uh, I I don't think I do compared to a lot of folks. I um, I mean I I would just say I think success is um is a hard thing. I I don't think 
I don't think success is, is one target that we're like, it looks one way is what I'm saying. And um, I do think they're, they're, especially for achievers, you know, if you, if you are a high achieving person, I think it's easy to say, I have to be the best. I have to be sort of number one in my field and have this real picture of what success looks like. But I think, I think Ethan's right is that we need a more fully human idea of what, of what a more fully orbed idea. And I think, I mean, speaking as a, as a Christian here, like the person that I claim is um, the picture of human flourishing died penniless, poor, alone, um, abandoned by almost all his followers on a cross. And um, that's my picture of success, right? And so <laughs> that's a weird picture of success. Mm -hmm. um, and so that I think it should trouble kind of any kind of American dream idea of like, it's all about sort of like my own achievement and being awesome and getting in you know, like my picture in a magazine or getting in the New York Times or whatever is your thing. Um, or, you know, getting the um, Nobel Prize or something, I think. And those are good things. And I, do, I don't want to denigrate those gifts. But at the end of the day, um, I think success looks like faithfulness um, to God, which to, which can be very churchy sounding, but I mean um, that it looks like um, being who we were made to be. That's what success is. And so, um, and that is going to involve of like going back to what Colin said, like suffering and, um, and some pain. And um, there's no part of the sort of American dream idea that success would go with suffering, right? That it would go with diminishing yourself. Um, so I do think there, there is, I mean, I, I've had a lot of conversations recently with people that um, have actually chosen in ways to be downwardly mobile, have chosen in ways to give up power, to empower other people, to, um, to go out of their way to try to give, to give up what might look like success for something that's even more beautiful and enduring, which is serving other people. Yeah. An, an, an interesting way of thinking about the ministry of Jesus is that it was short in time, but incredibly intense. Um, you know, we, we have all those stories about, you know, overnight boat trips, right? <laughs> Getting back and forth across the Sea of Galilee. Um, because because the days, in fact, were long, and so I think right, it's it's about yeah. it's about what what we're doing in the world um, and why we're doing it, and maybe I, I think it's too easy for us to quantify the hours and and see yeah it in those terms only. I think that's right, um, and, and I, but I also want to say like I think because part of I the important work of Jesus is stuff we haven't heard of. Like he would, in, in this, this is what I mean. He spent most of his life as a blue collar carpenter guy. Right. Like not a worker of either metal or wood. Like we're not even sure. Yeah. And we, he, what did he make? Like apparently nothing that great to stick around. Like nobody put it in a shrine. Like, yeah. so, but that Gregory Nazianzus, which is this fourth century bishop in um, what is now modern day Turkey said that which, Christ did not assume he did not heal, but the opposite is true that, that he did take on, he did heal or he did redeem. And so if, if, if Jesus spent his time in like ordinary work, mm -hmm. and this wasn't a time where like he was in a vast oppressive empire, there were lepers that needed to be healing. There were work he could have been doing and he was taking time building something. Mm -hmm. Then I really think, um, then, then that means that any that all good work is valuable work, and it it doesn't mean that you're gonna be the number one person of Fortune 500 company, or that you're gonna get a prize, or that your name is gonna be a household name. Um, I think that I guess we need to redefine our notion of success. Yeah, no, I I I completely agree with you. I just wanted 
to flag that it's so easy for us to think about it in terms of number of hours and that that's, you know, that's a misleading metric. Um, we need to wrap up, but um, Colin or Ethan or Tish, any last word that you, that you want to pass along? We're a little over time, so maybe it really is just a word. Go do good work. <laughs> All of you, I know that it's um, a scary and unsettled moment. Um, I heard from a, a friend who was watching this that they found it helpful. Um, if anyone else wants to talk one-on-one -on, -one on this, I'm pretty easy to find. Ethan Z at MIT.edu uh, for the next few weeks, at least. Um, drop me a line. Happy to talk if anyone wants to talk one-on-one. -on -one. Great. Thank you, Ethan. Yeah, I think this is a really hard time. I think being in your 20s and, and figuring out life and vocation stuff is really hard, and it's hard for everyone. Um, so if it is hard for you, don't think that you're the only one every person who's um, the majority of us don't don't have like a straight path to success and that's fine that's okay yeah there's a I this just came to me um, but I was thinking about some of Jesus's words to us about like he, he he just talks about his yoke is easy and his burden is light just meaning that Jesus um, on the cross he said his work is finished and if you think the, a big part of the challenge around our work is that we're working for more than just work. It's not just about the money. It's, it's about salvation. We, we're trying to justify ourselves. But if you accept Christ, then he's done all the work. And the work can just be the work. It's like I do it because I like to do it. And it takes all the pressure off. That's why he says his burden is light. He's, the work is finished. And so you can just work just to do the work. You can teach the kids just to teach the kids. And you can... You can, whatever you're going to do, work at Dunkin' Donuts, whatever you're going to do, you can do it just for that. And it doesn't have to be about your life's meaning and calling. Jesus already, he already handled it. 